to love truth for truth's sake is the principal part of perfection in this world and the seed plot of all other virtues. So Extinction Rebellion has been set up in order to deal with the climate emergency, but it's been set up in order to go about it in a particular way that, as Andre said, puts the truth at the centre of um, the equation, as you might say. And the reason for that is because, as John Locke says, if you lose hold of the truth, if you start um, going down the path of expediency, then you undermine all of the virtues. You become corrupt and you become part of the problem. And there's 5,000 years of wisdom in that statement, I would suggest. Many traditions make the same point. So I'm here this evening, obviously, uh, to talk for myself. I'm not talking on behalf of Extinction Rebellion or any group. Um, and I want to do two things. I just want to clear up a few material facts which are continually lied about within XR and outside XR. And this situation with global support has given me the opportunity to do that in so much as what they've said about me has been materially incorrect. But more importantly, because my uh, what I'm going to try and communicate is what's been happening with global support isn't primarily about me. That's not why I'm here on this call. It's primarily about the health of the Extinction Rebellion movement. And I have a deep concern as an individual and a co-founder about that. And I'll make an argument about why I'm concerned about it, which obviously you're free to agree with or not. I'm simply uh, giving my opinion as someone that helped to found this, uh, this organization. Okay, so I'm going to start first of all with, with some of the substantial points in the global support um, statement about me, which as I said, have been repeated several times or many times and uh, incorrect. So the first one relates to the uh, quote Holocaust comments. So first of all, as I've done many times in the past, I wish to apologize to the movement for the mistake that was made and for the comments that went out by the Zeit newspaper. I want to make clear that I'm not anti-Semitic and any implications that I am are incorrect. I have a deep and abiding love for the Judaic tradition and it's a major inspiration in terms of my own moral philosophy. And in so much as it needs stating, I find the Holocaust an, an absolute obscenity and has horrified me throughout my life and is probably the single biggest reason why I got involved in radical politics when I was a teenager. Um, the thing that's materially incorrect and uh, lied that was, dis that was spread about this episode was that I sent a memo out indicating uh, that I had an intention to cause disruption through my comments to the Zeit newspaper. This is materially incorrect. And um, I have three statements from people who are involved in putting out that memo, involved in that memo, which I think Andrew's going to put in the uh, link now, if that's possible, Andrew. Um, so I'm just going to read out the relevant bits. Obviously, you can read the whole statements if you wish. Um, okay, hopefully this will work. Okay, so uh, this is important because if the memo went out beforehand, then that would confirm that I intended to cause disruption. Uh, in actual fact, it went out afterwards. So uh, this is a statement from um, Tim Crossland, who's a, a, a well-known lawyer in London involved in the anti heathrow campaigns. And his point two says, I can confirm the memo that Roger sent to media messaging was written only after his interview with Desite. Uh, he was the person that helped me uh, organise the memo. And then the person who received the memo was Nula from the UK press team. And she says, it was my understanding at the time, and it's still my understanding now, that Roger wrote the memo subsequent to his interviews with De Spiegel and De Zeit. And a statement by Gail Bradbrook um, saying, I spoke to Roger the day after, and he was very clear it wasn't his intention and I believed him. So I'm just sort of laboring that point. 
because um, I, I have suffered a year <laughs> of people abusing me and uh, uh, telling me something that's untrue. I did actually put this in two Facebook uh, posts shortly afterwards, but it's been ignored. And I'm still subject to abusive emails and comments because of this misunderstanding or lie that's been put about me. And if just an example of that is two days ago, I received uh, an email from a German XR group, um, obviously, well, not obviously, but unsurprisingly, not actually signed by anyone. But, uh, and this went as follows. Um, uh, you uh, remember all too well the havoc that you caused by purposely planting Holocaust comments in the well-known Zeit article. The mails between you and the media and messaging team UK that proved how you planned this, knowing full well how it, that would be received by the public. So, I just want to make that clear and on the public record that, that obviously that email is incorrect. I have communicated that to people in, in XR Germany on numerous occasions, but they haven't taken it upon themselves to correct that material mistake. And this isn't a small matter, as hopefully you understand, but being accused of using the Holocaust for personal gain is a massive criticism and it's not correct. So I just want to quick, that's the main thing. There's another sort of point in that email, which was that it's a bit more sort of ridiculous, is um, that apparently I said, why, uh, that I said in an interview that I think it would be a good idea to put a bullet through the heads of uh, people that are involved in um, being responsible for the climate emergency. So I think they have put the, the um, taken the little recording out of the interview. Well, uh, as you may know, if you're involved in interviews, and I've done 200 of them, that you can take anything out of an interview and manipulate it. And just for the record, what I was saying was, uh, as a sociological prediction, as a social science scholar, I'm making a fairly, fairly um, uh, reasonable prediction that if there's social collapse, there will be people dying who are responsible for the climate emergency. I was saying that as a sociological prediction, obviously not as, as an, uh, something that I personally would want. And as people who know me, know that I've been a passionate uh, activist for nonviolence since I was 14 in the peace movement and God knows what else. So uh, it's ridiculous to extract a small quote from a, a, longer, a longer article. And that sort of leads me on to my broader point about how the global support statement and other people in Extinction Rebellion basically do the corporate press's work for them by, by having the, by basically accepting a, an extraction of a quote from a long interview, which is then used to, you know, make money out of you or to try and destroy your reputation. And I would ask people, as the phrase goes in the UK, never believe everything you read in the newspapers, um, because you can be sure that the name of the game is to make money or to try and undermine you by taking you out of context. And the broader issue here, I guess, is, is that Extinction Rebellion more gem and social movements more generally need to be aware that this is what the press do. This is their bread and butter activity. And uh, the first thing to do is if you, if you hear about a public statement is to check the facts and to put it into context. And I would argue that people that speak publicly uh, in Extinction Rebellion need to be supported rather than um, excommunicated, as it were, because of things that have been taken out of context. And of course, the intention here is, is very important as well. And coming back to the John Locke quote, I think the issue here is, 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 someone, is someone being honest and telling the truth. If that leads to lots of people not liking them, then that's not a reason for getting rid of them. That's a reason for supporting them. In other words, intention is enormously important when you're when you're judging someone's actions. And as I've said many times, I didn't intend to cause disruption through the Holocaust, and I certainly didn't want to intend to say that I supported violence. 
and I have sworn on my children's lives, <laughs> and I quite like my children, so <laughs> to say that um, that um, I didn't uh, intend these things. So, yeah, I state my case. Okay, so the reason why this has come to a head, the next sort of part of what I want to say is that the global support statement uh, you know, of their intention for me never ever to be part of global support isn't really my problem. If global support makes that decision, that's fair enough. However, the way they did it is a gross violation of Extinction Rebellion's um, uh, ways of working. First of all, they never contacted me before they made the statement, which would have been a polite and decent thing to do. When they made the statement, they made material inaccuracies, uh, which I've just outlined, and they haven't corrected those, even though I asked them. And I asked them to get in touch with me personally so we could talk about it, leading to an open dialogue as is XR practice. And they haven't done that, even though I've emailed them several times. And um, what, what I think this constitutes really is cruel behaviour, but also more importantly, corrupt behaviour. And I want to, this is my argument <laughs> that I want to present to you, is the issue here isn't about Roger Hallam, and it's not really about treating individuals badly. It's about a culture of openness or a culture of closeness. And I've been involved in, in organising and social movements for 40 years since I was 15 years old. And I've seen a, a pattern of degeneration happen over and over and over again. When, when social movements become closed, when people aren't personally accountable for their actions, when people are excommunicated or whatever for no good reason without, and without due process, then that's a cancer that spreads through the network and the organism and it pushes people out. And since I wrote my public letter to global uh, support, I've had many, many supportive emails by people that also being pushed out and bullied and shouted at and, and treated in, in very unpleasant ways. So um, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that this isn't me having a tantrum. I really don't mind uh, global support not having me in their, or their, their group, got plenty of things to do. It's because I've got, I'm trying to make an absolutely serious point about social movements. What an even more serious point is that, is that this social movement is basically here to prevent the extinction of the human race. So it's absolutely impor important that everyone in this call and everyone listening to this thinks very carefully about the health of the movement they're part of. Because if you destroy the health of the movement, it won't be able to do the job that we have set out to do. And I'll, I'll just give a very quick uh, example of this, that I spent much of my 20s sort of organizing um, various communities and networks and what have you, facilitating and mediating. And, and many, many organizations set up with utopian aims, but because they don't have proper governance and they don't have proper accountability, they start disappearing down the plug hole. And one particular example was uh, an intentional community in the UK, and they started off very utopian, and then they became, you know, gradually more, more and more disorganised, and then people moved in and, and sold the, sta the staircase. And by the time I arrived, they'd been taken over by Satanists. And it sounds quite amusing, but it's, a, it's an appalling story of degeneration. And 90% of the communes and intentional communities collapsed during the 1970s and 1980s because of this structurelessness and unaccountability. And the ones that did survive, of course, were the ones that had proper constitutions and proper accountabilities. And I've asked two or three times and had two or three attempts to get global support and international XR to have a proper uh, open, open uh, constitution. And, you know, there's thousands of organizations around the world that do this. It's not really rocket science. I've spent much of my life involved in workers' cooperatives and housing cooperatives, and the simple process is to vote an executive committee that then has disciplining power to get on and make sure the organisation works well. And if it doesn't, then the people who are on that committee are electable and accountable, and they can be voted off. And that would be a simple reform, which I think would sort out much of the problems in global support and dare I say extinction rebellion uh, uh, internationally and um, so I, I can go into more details if people want to ask me a question about that but I, what, what I feel would positively come out of this 
a conflict with global support is an alliance of the willing people who are associated with the group and or have recently left uh, coming together and putting together a reasonable uh, programme of reform. And I think everyone in the movement should be involved and support that in so much as this group is not just another group. I just want to remind everyone it does. It is, I mean, said in the statement today, it's not the headquarters, but it effectively is in so much as it holds the social media keys. It's able to and um, it's able to provide access or not access to the database. Uh, it has the cat a lot of money, which is given to XR internationally. So whether you like it or not, this, this organization is holding the reputation and organizational uh, coherence of, of XR internationally. So it should be of concern to all of us um, what's going on. Um, so yeah, I hope that uh, some people will come forward to, to produce a, a reform uh, proposal for it. And I, I have no intention of being personally involved in that because it needs to be done by people involved in, in that network. But what I want to finish on is a more positive note, dare I say it, which is I think one of the things that may come out of this uh, episode is, yeah, um, two more minutes, <laughs> is, is that um, I've been very honoured to be able to advise a number of Extinction Rebellion groups around the world. And I think what can and should happen is uh, international Zoom calls, a bit like this, where the international movement can come together in a joyful, welcoming and diverse way and have breakout groups on the very many ways in which we can practically mobilise uh, as we enter 2021. And that's something that if you're interested in, you can contact me and I hope over the coming weeks we can help help to uh, bring people together in, in the movement through open organising, which was, in my view, the original plan. And uh, yeah, that's that's it because Andrea's told me to stop. <laughs> so I hope that was a too incoherent, but um, feel apologies if I've gone over a, few, a lot of points quite briefly, but hopefully you have a greater understanding than when you enter this call. And again, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Roger. Uh, from my side, I just want to say that, sorry, I'm trying to keep up with all the messages coming in. Um, there were a couple of people that asked why we've disabled chat um, based on past experiences with these kinds of calls. Um, what, what the chat can devolve into can be damaging to the purpose of a call like this. So we've discussed it and agreed to disable the chat and to use the chats specifically for stacking the um, names of people who want to ask questions. Um, those of you who want to ask questions, um, you're welcome to just uh, send a chat to me saying, I have a question, that's more than enough. Um, in the meantime, I've already got a list here now of 10 people, 12 at the moment, who have questions. I'll post it so that everybody can see the list in the interest of as much fairness as we can manage. And I did see Sarah Webb around just now. She's the first name on the list. Um, Sarah Webb, I see you and I'm going to unmute you. Sarah. Hello, so I didn't realize I was gonna to have to say this out loud. <laughs> I did submit it by email. Okay, here we go. So just getting down to the nitty gritty because that's how I roll. Um, shall we go ahead and do a mass arrest action in London anyway? We could ask rebels to sign up to Action Network. We could say we really want people to commit to being arrested. Let's not faff about. We simply haven't got time. We don't need to brand it XR. So that if XR International don't like it, does it matter? And it personally saddens me that you feel the need to apologize again and again for something. I feel that forgiveness should be one of our values. Thank you. Thank you. Roger, anything you wanna? Yeah, well, thank you very much, Sarah. And sorry you put on the spot there. <laughs> It's always a little bit scary, isn't it? Um, yeah, I just want to just say, just before I answer that, um, 
that I'm, I'm very, very open in case it's not obvious to public dialogue. And um, I'm still, or still asking uh, Exile Global to have a public conversation with me. And I promise that I'll be civil, <laughs> but also uh, something like this could happen again if people don't feel they've been or had time to ask me questions. Um, I'm hoping to do something with other co-founders as a sort of ask us anything sort of session. And I'm hoping that that will, we've had a talk about it today, that that might create a, a sort of monthly call where people in the movement can take the microphone, as it were, and talk about how they see things so that many more voices can be brought forward in a spirit of openness and dialogue. So again, hopefully this is a good thing that will come out of this process. In terms of your specific question, sorry, Sarah, is obviously, <laughs> um, you could start asking me all sorts of questions. <laughs> so um, I will sort of briefly ask, uh, answer this, but um, it won't surprise you to know that, yes, I, I, my, my absolute passion in this movement is civil resistance and mass civil disobedience. That's what I've spent much, much of my time trying to organize and, and promote. And I think I can't emphasize enough the absolute necessity for mass civil disobedience in 2021. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I've got words to express my absolute determination to make this happen as much as I can. And that's why I work 12 hours a day, apart from Saturdays, <laughs> to make this happen. And that's not because I'm workaholic, but because we simply do not have the time. And this is why I'm sticking my neck out today and in this process to say, this will not happen if you have a dysfunctional movement. And I, I, by that, I don't mean a utopian, everyone getting on with each other movement, right? Obviously shit happens, everyone knows that. But there's a difference between everyday crap and serious corruption and serious bullying. And we need to separate those two things out. And as I say, I hope people will agree that in this instance, this is not XR behavior, it needs to be challenged. So that that's, you know, this is why these two things come together. Don't get me wrong for a minute, right? I hate processed stuff, but there has to, you know, I'm an actions guy, as you know, and I want to get people out in the street. But unless you have core, core integrity at the center of your system, then it, it, it's, it, it's useless, right? And uh, who cares where it's sex are? Who cares wh wh who it is, right? The, at the bottom, the bottom line is thousands of people need to step up um, to do their duty to, you know, their traditions and to their children. And um, yeah, and good luck. <laughs> Sarah, yay, nay, cool. You can also just give us a thumbs up or a no go away or something, thumbs up, right. Uh, Mark Latimer, I was looking, but I'm not seeing Mark Latimer. Is anybody else seeing a Mark Latimer? Mark, can you wave if you're here? All right, we'll keep that. Gary Crane. Not seeing a Gary Crane. I forgive, forgive me if I skip over you and we can always go back. Lawrence, BCN. Lawrence, no, no. Um, Claudia, I did see. Oh, sorry, no, Claudia, I'm talking Maria Prito. Talking rubbish, sorry. If you are going to be asking a question, please do turn your video on so we can find you. First time we're trying this particular format, so apologies for any kinks that we still need to work out. I'm going to, I'm going to go to starting from the bottom. Well, let's start from, yeah, let's start from the bottom up for one or two. So that'll give me a chance to find more names in the list. So Claudia, can we go to, and the screen just moved away. Um, Claudia, can you move if you have your video on? And Ilana or Roger, if you guys can see, if you see Claudia. There, I got you. There you are, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, 
I can see like this pattern or similar things like this, what you said, Roger, that pattern of degeneration of social movements. Um, I can see that on many levels at the moment at XR. So I find it quite um, frustrating and it, it makes it, it's making me a bit anxious. I don't have that much experience with it. Um, I'm wondering um, if there is like a concrete action point that would lead to a better culture, like, I don't know, rethinking the principles and values maybe, or adding something to it, or, I don't know, something like that. Um, and even if there is, I'm wondering where is, is there a point where it would waste too much energy and time to trying to resolve this? And wouldn't it be better to just say, uh, we leave the toxic bits behind and we don't really care about the XR label that much anymore and we just move on with something else. Yeah, well, the, the first thing to say, thanks, Claudia. <laughs> I mean, the, the first thing to say is it's extremely complicated, aren't they, organisations? So anything that I say is going to be sound a bit simplistic, you know. So um, forgive me for that. But what I do think is one of the main problems in radical progressive cultures, for want of a better word, is the lack of understanding of the need to control all system decisions. By all system decisions, I mean, I mean who controls the money, who controls what's, who gets in and who gets thrown out. Um, who decides the major all system events like global rebellions uh, and such like. And the fact of the matter is, is these decisions have to be made or if they're not made, then that's a decision in itself. So you have two choices, really. One is to try and pretend they don't exist, which is what's commonly called a tyranny of structurelessness, whereby people end up making the decisions through, you know, access to to various informal networks. Or you have a constitution where people make it explicitly, it's explicit who's making those decisions and they have definable power and accountable power and you know how they get on into that group and you know how to get them off. And my argument, and this is only an argument, <laughs> my argument is the, the Extinction Rebellion needs to grow up as an organization and accept that you do need executive people in an, ex, an explicit executive role. And you need to know who they are and how to get rid of them. And there's various mechanisms doing that. None of not, that does not mean that power conflicts don't exist, but you don't get catastrophic collapses in trust and in, 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 in relations in the organization, which you do. And you can see to a certain extent in global support because no one knows who's, you know, I still don't know who's written this statement, <laughs> you know. Uh, hello, guys. <laughs> um, so I think it's unavoidable, Claudia, to be honest with you, that you have to have a structure, um, because who's going to decide where the rebellions are going to be? Who's going to decide how long they're going to happen? Who's going to negotiate with the governments? You know, these are all executive decisions, and we have to find a way of, creating a structure to make good enough decisions on, on, those, on those things. And that requires a formal structure. And, um, you know, there's been a hundred years of self-organization in workers' crops and housing crops, and they sorted it out through what's called democratic management, which people vote, you know, people vo are voted onto a, a central group, and then they have a limited amount of time to do their good work and they can be voted off. So that seems to be a good enough way of doing it, but it is necessary in my view. Cool. Um, any response to that? Sorry, my screen's messed up. Right, I see next... Philip. Philip Middleton would like to respond. May I unmute Philip Andre? I wasn't meaning for someone else to respond, just from uh, Claudia. Oh, I see. Maybe, maybe Philip would like to put his, his comments in chat. Put his name 
then we have found Maria. Sorry, we think we've figured out our system now. So we'll next go to Maria. Claudia, was there any Claudia, more comments? Claudia, you just come back. Uh, thumbs Correct. up. Okay, thank you for that. And then next, I believe we're going to Maria Preto. That's right. Maria? Ah, okay. Hello. Um, I have many questions, but something that is resonating with me and is happening um, in Spain, and I think it's like a kind of holonic symptom, <laughs> like something that happened to you, Roger, is happening also in different scales and intensities in, in Spain. Uh, I have been in the movement since the beginning and I have seen how it has evolved and how different groups have formed and how relationships have, have changed. Even the, um, the conversations in Telegram um, some people are uh, constricting a lot, uh, open dialogue and uh, healthy agonism. Um, there is a baseline in Spain, this is all my perception and what I have seen, my observation, that everything has to get, has to reach a consensus. And I think um, it is not enough because there are many dimensions in each situation, in each human being, in each uh, view of a reality of a problem that cannot be addressed through language. So how, how can you get a consensus when you even cannot articulate what is going on? So I'm also the, taking into account the vulnerability of each person because we are dealing with uh, taking care of life and Gaia, the planet, the soil, the water, but the issue of vulnerability is central. And uh, uh, most of that does, uh, doesn't have uh, words, no language. We have to embed the language together and we need safe spaces to, to share um, these uh, issues. And so it's like, uh, in my view, uh, the movement in Spain is dead. This is my view. Uh, it is stuck with this consensus maniac. I don't say that it's not useful sometimes, but it has become a commandant. Uh, and for me, it's not attractive because I like complex issues. I like to navigate complexity or, you know. And um, so my question is, what do you think about this? What, what is a, what does the health have to do with, with this, I mean, with, with this observation that I'm sharing here. Thank you. Well, well uh, thank you. Um, okay, so I'll, 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 at the danger of being oversimplistic, I'll mention three things that I think are a major problem. So first of all, is maybe I'm being old fashioned, but I'm of the opinion, and I think there's a substantial academic literature now that supports the idea that social media is actually undermining connectivity and sociability. And this is a major threat to the, the democratic culture of, 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 our, of our countries. And the, re the reason for that is because people are behind a wall. And we know psychologically, when people can hide, then they treat each other a lot worse. You know, I mean, I've had a, an email, this an anonymous email this afternoon, which has just called me a fascist from someone in, ex, in, in global support, right? Um, why, why is that possible? Because the person could be anonymous. He wouldn't be able to say that to my face, or it's unlikely he would, uh, because when you're talking to someone face to face, you have eye to eye contact and that creates a humanity between you. Um, so that's a major problem. And I have hard, I spend hardly any time on social media because <laughs> I'm not interested. I'm not interested in it's a waste of time. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is is to understand Extinction Rebellion is set up with a very particular philosophy. That's why it's spread around the world, and that is the philosophy of nonviolent communication. Right? This is absolutely central. This is why thousands of people, ordinary people around the world, got involved with it in contrast to the abject failure of the purist and dogmatic left, 
which had dominated the climate movement for the previous 30 years. And I'm saying that analytically, I know lots of people in those movements and they worked very hard, but they made and continue to make the fatal error that judging people and being abusive to people produces a mass movement. It doesn't, it produces purist cults. That's the sociology. And if we're going to win this battle, we need mass participation in civil disobedience, which means thousands of ordinary people who don't like, know all the language games, that don't know, you know all the politics, to feel welcome, even though they don't quite know what they're about. And if you don't do that, you're not going to succeed. So, you know, that's, that's, that's where we're at. And the thing about consensus is, <laughs> I mean, in my 20s, I did several hundred workshops on consensus. <laughs> it used to drive me mad, <laughs> saying what a great idea consensus was, you know. And then, you know, by the time I left my 20s, I realised it was rubbish, <laughs> which was a bit of a blow to my ego, as you can imagine. And I think a lot of people went through that same transition. And Extinction Rebellion was set up with a specific post-consensus orientation, which again has been lost largely which is it's a holocratic orientation, which is a, a long word. But what it basically means is, if you're not doing harm to the movement, just go and fucking do it, right? You know, if, if, if a local group wants to stop you setting up another group, they can't stop you. You should go and do it. If you want to go and sit down in Madrid and you want to do it on a Wednesday rather than a Friday, no one can stop you. You, go, you can go and do it. That's That's... That's the spirit in which we set up Extinction Rebellion. And we need to make clear to people internationally that if someone's in your country and they want to set something else up, that's cool, right? <laughs> you are not a gatekeeper. It's not a gatekeeping movement. Sorry, you know, we're not an old left, you know, if you don't agree with the gatekeeper, you get chucked out of your team. That's not what we're about. So, you know, if you want to be about, if you want to be about that sort of gatekeeping, there's 101 organizations out there that do that sort of thing. So go and join them and good luck. But in Extinction Rebellion, if you want to get on with something, you can get on with it, which is why I will set up, you know, facilitate setting up an international Zoom conferences where people can get together in a spirit of dialogue and celebration to share their skills, regardless of what global support wants to do, you know, global wants to, support wants to do it, fantastic. If someone else wants to do it, fantastic. So let it all get on, you know, let it all flow. That's that's the spirit. So best of luck in Spain. <laughs> Ria? I'm seeing smiles. Thank you. Uh, next, can we go to Lawrence? Um, Lawrence, you should be unmuted. Yes. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. I'm from Barcelona. Some would say it's Catalonia. Other people say it's in Spain. So I'm also in Spain. Um, and uh, yes, it's been a difficult time in Spain. I agree with, with Maria. I do not think it's finished. I think that we can regenerate. <laughs> And uh, from you know, following this line, um, I think that um, when there, there are issues within in you know, a chat group or a commission and so forth, um, they need to be um, solved, I think, uh, within, if it's possible, within the commission. Um, and I, uh, as you were saying, Roger, I think the nonviolent communication is essential. Um, so uh, if someone is... Not, not using that, uh, you know, non-violent communication. It should be asked to uh, uh, to use it um, politely, and then if they repeat that, or they, for example, use there's another possibility. They use the the chat, uh, the group for talking about other things that have not got to do with the function of that group, um, which is kind of disturbing a bit the function of the group and our goal in this emergency. emergency. So, um, so uh, and if they continue doing that and saying, oh, well, you're censoring me, you know, censoring me by, by telling me not what to put here in this group. 
And uh, the minutes, uh, you know, they don't have many minutes to try to avoid this catastrophe. So, um, so there has to be a way of, of uh, letting this person know not to continue doing this and maybe at, at the third time uh, to, to silence this person or uh, find another place. And I can't have a lot of compassion to this person, but if they are um, interfering with the common good, uh, they're interfering even for, for with his good because you know it's not it's not helping the our cause okay so um so this is one thing and then I, i'd say that uh like what happened to you and the same thing and what can happen in spain and has happened in spain i mean a team that is trying to uh manage this conflict yeah in a constructive way, listening to everyone and whatever language they're using, even even irate language. Um, and uh, anyway, I don't want to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and the same happened to you. Um, I think, I mean, it would have been ideal if you could solve that with global support privately, I think. But if this is public, um, I hope this is an opportunity for helping everything go better <laughs> and I shut up here. Roger. Thanks. Um, well, j j yeah, you, you said quite a few things there. <laughs> so just come back to me if I haven't replied properly because I, I tend to forget what I'm supposed to be saying. So sorry about that. But um, um, yeah, well, I, w I will say one thing, which is, is I, I don't, I think there's a tendency in Extinction Rebellion amongst, in, amongst its culture to be worried about conflict. And I think conflict's actually very good. The, the, the problem with conflict isn't conflict, it's how it's dealt with. And suppressing conflict is, is as bad as, is as bad as, as really bad conflict uh, when it's not dealt with. And I, you know, let's not beat around the bush. I am in conflict with global support. And I don't apologize for it because I'm annoyed and I have a right to be annoyed as I see it. And, but the way to have productive conflict is to be open to dialogue after you've stated your opposition to someone else's behavior. That's the difference, right? And unproductive conflict is when you say, you're bad, you know, I don't like what you've done and I'm not going to talk to you about it, right? And that's the situation with global support. So it's not, it's, it's not that I have a problem with their position. I have a problem with the way they go about it. And, and this is the origin of the corruption of power, which is I'm in power, I can say what I think about you and I have the power not to engage in dialogue, right? That's corruption, right? Because it's anti-democratic. And it's at the heart of the corruption of left-wing movements. And we say this over and over again in the present climate of people being cancelled and what have you, of people saying, yes, someone's done something wrong, quite right, but you don't have a right then to make them disappear because that has echoes of what happened in the 20th century, as we should know. And so that's, that's, where, that's where we're at here. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that global support haven't got a point or an argument and saying they need to enter into dialogue. And I feel that is so important that that's why I'm going to go on a fast about it, right? This isn't insignificant. The quality of democratic culture is central to the progressive project we're in, in the world at the moment. We're not here just to stop the climate emergency. We're here to stop the climate emergency and to stop fascism, right? <laughs> those that's our aim right we are a progressive organization we're not what here to to entertain the notion that we're going to betray all those millions of people who died for our equality and our liberty over the last centuries and that can't be emphasized enough so that's you know that's a response if you want to come back and just Ask me something. That um, in, in the interest of fairness and getting other people, can we All just right, say, sorry. Yeah. Lawrence, you okay Apologies with that? Apologies if I didn't quite answer everything, but yeah. anyway, that's a response. 
that's what came up. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, just to note that that uh, like here there is some moderation. So like for example, like unlike a chat group. Uh, a chat group, anyone can say anything all the time. And here we're one by one. So there's some kind of order because otherwise it would be so chaotic. Thank you very much for the response. Thanks. Yeah, Thank thanks. Uh, that, that's just reminding me just, uh, just to say this thing like that Extinction Rebellion welcomes all parts of everyone, right? But it doesn't welcome all behaviors. Let's make that clear. And when people enter an XR space, we don't tolerate all behaviors. And that's really the thing to be communicated about when people go online and go off topic or abusive. So, you know, welcome to democracy. It doesn't mean you've got the license to do anything. It means you've got the, you, you know, you've got the freedom to, to deliberate, not the freedom to abuse. Okay. Can we move on to Diana from Wandsworth? Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, I have several sort of connected questions and some of them actually have been more or less answered through other questions tonight, but I'll, I'll fire away anyway. Um, firstly, having co-founded Extinction Rebellion to be an autonomous self-organizing activist movement with no one particular leader, do you still believe this was the right decision? And then connected, um, do you think XR is in danger of becoming fractured and divided and in doing so become ineffective or, or fail? And if this is indeed what happens or may be happening, would this still be conforming to your view of revolution as you described in your pivoting to the end game talk as something that is messy and uncontrollable, but will eventually achieve our overall aim of saving at least some life on the planet? <laughs> um, right, how long have I got? Three, three minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Well, maybe just one... My, my, pers <laughs> my personal view is there's a fundamental flaw in the design of Extinction Rebellion, and obviously I'm talking on my own behalf here. And the fundamental flaw is the inability to create an accountable executive. So let me just preface this to say that I've been involved in participatory like design all my life, right? That's my life's passion. And it's how to empower people and create uh, um, mobilization and empowerment and all the rest of it, right? You know, I was a paid up social anarchist for 15 years. So I know the whole literature on why power is a bad thing. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is at a time of social crisis, when you need to get together a whole large group of people and engage in civil resistance, there needs to be executive control to discipline the system so that you can create a coherent strategy, right? And I'm not beating around the bush and using funny words, right? That's what I believe is necessary. And if that's not necessary, then at best, Extinction Rebellion will be suboptimal. It won't work very well. And at, at the worst, it will destroy itself through exhausting people in endless process politics, which is happening in the UK at the moment. And it's not difficult, right? As I said in my reply to many of the questions, it's not difficult to create an accountable democratic structure that does have executive control over key all system decisions. And I would ask people to put as much effort as they can into sort of getting Extinction Rebellions around the world to create those structures. That does not contradict the principle of decentralization and autonomy where, where you know, at the grassroots, obviously, people need to be, have the autonomy to get on and do things. But fundamental decisions need to be made cent centrally. And I think that's, you know, my understanding of the practical left-wing sort of research on decentralization reiterates this point, that unless you have a strong center, you don't get effective decentralization. You need to have a strong center in order to create decentralization. Otherwise, what you get is rotten boroughs, i.e. lack of accountability at the grassroots. So there's lots to be said about that, but that's one, one thing. Um, I think I think the thing I think the thing which is which will another thing that's really important is the emphasis on mobilization which is another angle, 
and, and I'm repeating myself, but I'll say it again, is unless Extinction Rebellion can get ordinary people into the movement, it's fucked, <laughs> okay? Because political middle-class people are weird, right? Most people think they're weird out there, and I'm sure it's certainly the case in Britain, it's certainly, I suspect it's just the case everywhere. That mass movement requires loads of different cultures because that's how you create a robust organization. You need businessmen in there, you need working class people, you need bus drivers, right? You don't just want the, the you know, the educated left urban bubble, right? Important as it is. And, and that's something that everyone needs to work on is to go out, and I'll say again and again, people need to go out and do the Heading for Extinction talk again and again, you know, five times a week, please, everyone. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I mean, the point on revolution is that Extinction Rebellion officially <laughs> doesn't want a revolution, but I do. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is because the political class is, in is going to be incapable of reducing carbon emissions by 50% in 10 years. Sorry, <laughs> it's not going to happen, guys. <laughs> you know, in terms of uh, what Biden's going to do and uh, what we need is a new constitutional settlement that produces a deliberative democracy for the 21st century. And that's the, the definition of what revolution is. And I'm sure that that realisation will come to the fore in the next five years as the Paris Agreement falls apart, as it already is. Um, so interesting times ahead. Thank you. In the interest of time, we can be quick. Um... Just a yay or nay from you, Diana. Yes, great, great answers. Thank you, Roger. Um, uh, Irene, if you could go next. Irene Ajikdakis. Harty Dakis from Sorry. the Netherlands. Okay, um, I have a question, uh, but first I want to thank you for your openness. And um, I fell in love with uh, Extinction Rebellion from the moment I... Uh, encountered it. I have an activistic past as peace activist. So I know the importance of nonviolent communication because I think that's the only answer to the situation we're in now. But uh, there was this, there, I want to come back to, to the basic where you started with, like the truth. The, the, the commandment we have is that we tell the truth. But in the way um, Anyway, how I met it here in the Netherlands is that the demand is that we demand from the government to tell the truth. But in the government, the people don't even know the truth. They, they don't realize the ecological collapse that's at hand. And what I see happening, what, what you tell us, also what's happening to you, I, saw, I also see it happening small in the Netherlands. And I hear it's also happening in Spain. It is, I think, because a lot of the people that are attracted to extinction want to do something about this. They see this collapse and they want to do something about it. And then they become an activist. And then they just don't take the other part of extinction, which is the, the mourning and the, the helping each other to face the truth. So all the time I thought, why don't we say face the truth? Because we're the ones telling the truth. If we say to the government, tell us the truth, then we make ourselves just another activistic group. We ask something from them, while everything we see is that they're failing. So, and if we go to like, hey, face the truth and telling the truth, then we also have to meet in ourselves where we are not being able to face the truth. And then you see things happening that uh, they want to like uh, get rid of a leader while we are an, an organization where there are no leaders. So it's time to grow up. Um, I don't know if I'm clear about this, but I see it very much the things happening in the organization and like the basic way we, we tell what we are, that they are interrelated. And if we bring more in our language about this understanding and the urgency we stand in, then we can also say like, hey, 
uh, it's not that I'm against fascism. I'm busy with something else to survive. Because if we are against something, we are fighting. And if we are fighting, we are part of this system that we say we want to change. Is this clear? Yeah, thanks. I mean, again, you brought up, uh, you know, a, a, a number of different points. I'm not quite sure what you want me to answer, but but yes, I mean, the main, the foundation stone of Extinction Rebellion is telling the truth and acting as if it's real. And the proposition to the government is not just to tell the truth, but as you say, to face the truth in the sense of to act upon it. So these two things go together. In, in, certainly in terms of moral philosophy and what John Locke was saying and what's central to you know, all our traditions around the world is the centrality of truth. And truth does not mean just speaking it, right? In, in most cultures, speech and action are the same thing. You know, that if you, if, you, if you are going to be in the truth, you speak and act it at the same time. And as we all know, there's a massive, uh, massive gap between what, you know, people in the governments are saying and what they're doing and all the rest of it. And I, I, was, I was just on a, a, a panel this week with three guys, three uh, EU bureaucrats, you know, <laughs> and I was going, we were at 1.3 degrees, Paris is rubbish, you know, and they were just incapable of responding to me, you know, not utterly incapable of responding in any meaningful way. They just wanted to talk about bureaucratic procedures. So we, we, know, we know what we're up, to, up, up for. And I think, I think the, way in which, the way in which we support each other in the truth is through, through community. And this is one of the things that I'm very interested in going forward is to try and connect people around the world because I'm in a very privileged position of being able to speak to many people around the world. And it's enormously empowering and, joyful activity because you realize there's people around the world that are just as passionate as you so that's what i'm hoping to facilitate is is this sense of community that we can build and, and solidarity and, and through that of course comes to courage and and just the last thing on the leaders right let, let another sort of misconception is is that you know Ex extinction rebellion is supposed to be a leaderless situation it's not it's supposed to be a leaderful situation right this is what holopacy is about. It's about encouraging people to step up. And the fact of the matter is, some people have oratory skills, some people have charisma to speak publicly, and we need to encourage those people because no social movement in history hasn't succeeded without oratory and without people standing up and empowering other people through their speech. And that's what one of the things I do. <laughs> I'm hoping someone else will do it <laughs> better than me <laughs> because it's quite scary. But, um, um, but, but that's, that's what I'm really passionate about is, to, you know, particularly young people and particularly people in the global south is bringing people into positions of public life so that they can communicate in the emotion and the horror of what's happening in their own language and speak to ordinary people in ordinary language, right? This is enormously powerful and enormously important. So let's, you know, every, any, once any of you find someone that's really good at ranting away, then get them up there on the social media, guys, and, you know, get them get them on, on YouTube. Let's get them talking, you know, on, on, a, on a YouTube video. And uh, let's bring these people on because, you know, the next generation needs to find its voice and it's not finding its voice as, at the moment and it needs to so hopefully that's all right and then i can retire <laughs> thank you thank you irene um i just want to quickly um note the time it's uh, almost quarter past i have agreed or already notified two people to be next ivan and simon can we push a little bit longer than what um some of us discussed roger how are you doing yeah, we well, take those two questions and then I'll just say a few final words and and then, yeah, we don't want to keep people too long, do we? <laughs> right. Ivan Anderson? You should be unmuted. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so this kind of goes back to what you brought up first, Roger, when you were speaking about 
um, John Locke and the importance of um, speaking truthfully and telling the truth. Um, I guess also if one is to arrive at a conclusion of addressing a problem, we need to first see the problem accurately and tell the truth about the problem in order to address it. Um, so then I'm not sure, bear with me, I'm not going to phrase my words very well. Um, so in your initial um, interview you gave with the magazine, The Driven Magazine, in which you spoke, um, you called the Holocaust, uh, you know, another fuckery or something like this. I think you were speaking initially about the motivation behind, the motivation behind uh, action or the motivation behind what you say, how that's so important in coming to understand the meaning that you're trying to, um, trying to give out, the, what you're trying to describe. And I feel like your, your motivation in that interview was not other than trying to um, clearly see the situation as it is, the present situation as it is. And in responding to the interview as if you, I guess there's two things. There's one to respond to the, I'll try to be brief, I'm sorry, forgive me my, my imperfection in how I speak. Um, two things, maybe you're trying to address the hurt that was, that arose from your interview. So that's one thing you need to address. But then the other thing is addressing the, the meaning of what you were trying to, what meaning you were trying to offer. What was your, what were you really trying to say in that interview? And if you only address the hurt with apologizing, saying you did something wrong, maybe it can um, obscure what you were trying to actually say in the first place, the truth that you were trying to, trying to get at. Because I don't think you were trying to get at, you weren't trying to be harmful. You were trying to bear, bring to light in your mind, I'm not able to say well, but you were trying to put a, bring perspective into our moment and see it in a larger perspective maybe kind of idea. I'm not saying very well again, but anything, anyways, there's these two things. One is addressing sort of the hurt that was arose. And the other is trying to really bring to light what you were meaning in the first place. And that if you only address the hurt, then the meaning of what you were trying to say can be, can be lost. And I think there might be something important in what you were trying to get at. In any case, I guess it, um, yeah. well, I don't know what I'm saying so much, Roger, but <laughs> how, do we, how do we cultivate a, how do we cultivate, how do we cultivate a, you know, a, as a community, how do we cultivate a space where we can, you know, where this can arise, where we can have the room. Yeah, yeah. For this to well, I, I, I think, I think, I think you're tr trying to say something that's enormously important. And what I want to say is that is the, the quote from John Locke sounds pretty obvious, right? Everyone likes the truth. Everyone should say the truth. But the fact of the matter is a, a time of radical evil, and we're in a time of radical evil, let's not beat around the bush, right? Telling the truth is enormously upsetting. It's enormously transgressive and it's extremely dangerous, right? You know, people die for telling the truth in times when murderous in, intent is, it exists in a society. And I think I struggle all the time with my conscience and my inability to effectively communicate the absolute indescribable horror of billions of people potentially starving to death in the next half century. And I have to face talking to scientists face to face on a regular basis who are excruciatingly emotional <laughs> about what they know, right? What they know. Day in, day out, these people have to look 
at the prospect of billions of people starving to death. And then they tell me, and then I have the responsibility, or whoever talks to the press has the responsibility to try and communicate this absolute horror and this absolute criminality to the public, to, to the public sphere. And as I said, I've done like 100, 200 interviews, right, with the media. And just about every time, the journalists are pathologically incapable of understanding the emotionality of what I'm trying to communicate. And what I found is the most effective way of doing that is to challenge the journalist themselves, right? And that, that, that's a difficult thing to do. And what happened in that interview, of course, is that they manipulated my, my argument with the journalist to make it look like I was relativizing the Holocaust when I was doing the exact opposite, right? The exact opposite, which is the Holocaust was an absolute obscenity. And if you believe the Holocaust was an absolute obscenity, you have a moral obligation to recognize what we're doing to our children is an absolute obscenity, right? That's what it is. So that's, that, that interview was a very powerful interview, you know? It went on for an hour and a half. And, you know, I'm just a farmer from Wales, right? So maybe I've got this wrong. But I feel like the German experience, you know, of what happened the last century has a massive moral lesson, right? For everyone in the world, which is if you don't speak the truth and if you don't act as if it's real and if you don't follow the moral law, then you'll, you'll destroy your society and you'll destroy your soul and you'll destroy civilization. And it, there's nothing more important, right? We've got five years, maybe we've got one year, maybe we've left it too late, but it's an absolute imperative that we understand the moral seriousness of what's being done in our name by our governments at this present time. And the next generation will look upon us in the same way as they look upon the Nazis in the 20th century, if we don't stand up and make a stand. And that's exactly what we're here to do, right? That's what I'm trying to do. It's very, very difficult. Ivan, okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Roger. Thank you. Um, Simon Sieverts. Thank you um, for allowing me to ask my question. Uh, I shall try and keep it quick. Um, I moved at the end or the mid mid nineties from the UK as a young person to Germany after being involved in, um, reclaim the streets and the one Stonia, uh, occupation and eviction. And, um, um, the, the, the thing that's kind of stuck with a few people here, uh, or at least that's, that's the, uh, the, the thing that the, um, the support group has said is that, that what you said was. Uh, tremendously unpopular people were leaving the organization and now i don't know if that's true i'm not a member of the support group by the way please believe me um but um the 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 quote that stuck here is that the holocaust is just another fuckery in human history and so that's the thing that's been put out into this public space and it's the the problem that everyone has uh, the word that everyone has a problem with here is the word just because it relativizes the Holocaust, which is um, something very different to what it is in the UK in a way. I, I felt that my life has definitely changed in these 25 years um, living here in Germany. And, um, you know, people people don't wear Palestinian, Pal um, Palestine scarves when they go on demos here. You know, if you're wearing one, people come up and they will ask you, oh, are you Fatah or are you... Um, you know, which part of the uh, Palestinian movement are you, you know, because they dislike the idea that it's a kind of unth that people are unthinking about this. They fought an armed insurrection in this country for 10 years, approximately with the Red Army faction, trying to get uh, 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 ostentatiously trying to get the government to admit that some of these people in very high positions still in the government, for example, the head of the German bank, 
um, et cetera, et cetera, that they were actual, actual Nazis, not just like, oh, he's a Nazi, didn't give him any chips, but actual <laughs> National Socialist Party members who had been left in the hierarchy and that they were insisting on the kind of truth that I know that you want to have, Roger, and I know the reference to John Locke is exactly the, the good thing that they were looking for in that period of, of, of great national and, and cultural pain that they went through after the after the war. And my question is this, I mean, I, I think it's terrible. I think you're right. You need to do something with the constitution in the organization. I think it's dis disgusting how the um, uh, the global support group support team has acted in this. This anonymity is is absolutely not OK. But my question is, A, do you think that that statement has actually done what the support group claims? and has caused a um, a participation crisis for XR within Germany, where I live, so this is my interest. And the second question is, what do you think could be done? I, I think there it has been a damage. I think that your name will be always associated with this um, sentence in Germany. They did an unbelievably good job of, um, of uh, tarring you and feathering you <laughs> with this one i'm afraid to say i know you're not anti-semitic um but um this is a real real problem I, I feel that's my feeling i don't know what the real numbers are like with you guys um that will be in the database um but and the, the question so the question is do you think that this has caused a real problem um for xr germany and the second thing is what do you think can be done to to solve that problem if is it is a public kind of trial that, that should be done should it maybe more of an attacking thing where you say let's go in with a with a with a 20 minute film or podcast to address exactly that sentence and to take it apart um in order to open the door again for light for participants who who want to do and believe uh what you do and believe in roger but they feel at the moment there are barriers there because they feel that you relativize the holocaust with this word just sorry so long yeah okay great thank you very much so i think first thing to understand about this is if you talk for a, an hour and a half on subjects of great moral importance and difficulty. I will look at your one and a half hours and I will take out a three second segment of it in order to make you look bad. I can guarantee I'll be able to do it. I challenge anyone to talk for one and a half hours without having three seconds of statement that makes you look bad, right? So this isn't about me and it's not particularly about the Holocaust comments. It's about how the media creates money out of decontextualizing people's speech, okay? And what media messaging groups need to do in Extinction Rebellion and generally on the left is to recontextualize whether the accusation is correct or not. You know, because when that statement came out, maybe I am anti-Semitic, right? So you need to have more data points to find out, go and have a look at the guy, see what other statements he's got, you know, record the interview, look at his past, look at what he's done, you know, weigh the evidence up, yes, and, you know, realise that that was a man manipulation of a three-second statement in a one-and-a-half-hour interview. So that's the first thing to say about it, which wasn't done, of course, and that's the related point is, is the more fundamental point, which is if a democracy is going to survive, in the present context, then you need open debate. You need open processes. And what didn't happen was that I wasn't allowed to make a case. We could have sorted this out within two weeks, right? Roger made a mistake, he's apologized for it, but he wasn't being malicious, he's not anti-Semitic, he didn't put the memo out, you know, blah, blah, blah. In other words, yes, Simon, there should be a trial. <laughs> I'm all in favor of trials, because then it comes out. <laughs> You know, but what, you know, people that don't want the truth to come out are not interested in due process. They're not interested in an open society. What they're interested in is pr promoting a dogmatic and reductive view of the world, which isn't open to evidence. So in the, in the future, if someone, if there is a problem, 
then there needs to be a due process disciplinary situation there yeah, with an end point and all the rest of it. This isn't rocket science. And it's something that we need to hold on to because people do say bad things and there are bad people, right? <laughs> so it needs to be investigated. Um, and that's really what we, we learn from it. And I think in terms of the, you know, the attempt by the establishment and the powers to be, there will be even more manipulation as we enter Gandhi's fight stage against the corporate elite. They will, this is, this was just the first act, guys, right? They, there's all sorts of nasty tricks people do that are rich and powerful against, uh, against people, you know. Before you know it, they'll be saying that I've raped someone or something, right? You know, this is what happens. It's happened recently with a famous figure, I've got his name, you know, um, the WikiLeaks guy, right? This is what we need to mature as a movement so that we know that this is coming down the line. So that when it happens, we're prepared. And with half an hour, we put out a rebuttal statement saying this is absolutely ridiculous. We know Roger Allen's not anti-Semitic and all the rest of it. And here's the evidence. And we invite the opposition to a public YouTube debate. And I've said to Exile Germany on about four or five occasions, let's have a YouTube debate. So I'm publicly asking them, let's have a YouTube debate. Let's have a discussion. You know, closeness, it, all closeness does is leads to totalitarianism. Right. Look at the 20th century, guys. You know, that's the situation. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Andre, is that it? I think that is us. Um, for the record, there's at least uh, 12 people's names I have here that we haven't gotten to. So perhaps we can quickly just uh, talk about if there's an email address that people can follow up through or what thoughts there are in terms of where this conversation might go further. Well, what, what I'd like to suggest is, I, as I said, I am genuinely totally open to having further dialogue and communication with people, you know, within the realms of practicality. So one, one idea is those 12 people could put their questions in writing to me and I, I can respond. Um, alternatively, I'm into, you know, a private Zoom conversation with a group of individuals if they're interested. Um, and as I said, I'm hoping other things being equal that myself and Gail and um, Claire and Kofi from the UK will be doing a Ask Us Anything session next Saturday uh, at the same time. <laughs> so you can come back and try and get your question in there. Uh, and this should, should segue to uh, a bunch of Zoom calls when other people in the movement can be in the, in the seat, as it were, and being asked. So that it's not just us and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so hopefully that's okay. But you've got my public email address, so feel free to email me if you've got any other, you know, ideas about how how we can, um, you know, effectively communicate. Um, that's all good. Um, can I say a final word, or you saying a final word, Andy? Um, I think I will let you say a final word and then at the very end, if you don't mind, I would just finally like to uh, unmute everybody and um, um, let everybody say, you know, at least say goodbye to each other. Great. Okay. Well, I just, I just want to finish by thanking everyone for taking the time on Saturday to uh, listen to me. I'm very, feel very um, grateful and appreciative and I, I, it's always a massive honour to be involved in Extinction Rebellion and being in service to the uh, to this amazing <laughs> this amazing mobilisation that's been created. I always have to pinch myself to realise it all started with 15 people in a room looking rather slightly disorganised. So thank you so much for all the work you do on behalf of myself and everybody that's going to come on this earth in future generations. You're all heroes and. I wish you all the best of luck and we'll need it, won't we? Thank you.